Well, welcome everyone uh, for joining us today for our next monthly instalment of the Open Court webinar series. Today, we're talking about property hotspots, specifically market moves, uh, budget updates, and hot tips for investors. Uh, my name's Michael Beresford. I'm the Director of Investment Services at Open Court, and I had the pleasure of catching up with Dr. Andrew Wilson, the Chief Economist for My Housing Market. Andrew is one of the most sought-after experts in the Australian housing market, providing market commentary and media updates on what's actually happening on the ground. Uh, I've really enjoyed talking to Andrew. This is the third time now in just over 12 months. As our regular viewers will know, we love to bring data-based insight and research to, to you uh, because that's what really guides our investment decisions. And there's no one better than uh, Dr. Andrew Wilson to give us those, uh, those ups. Uh, updates and insights today. Uh, Andrew, thanks for joining us once again. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks very much for the intro to Michael. And uh, it's always good to be talking about property, particularly when we've got a pretty hot market at the moment everywhere. It's always nice when the sun's coming up, indeed. So let's uh, let's get right into it. Uh, you're the man with the answers, so I'll keep it pretty brief and, and look forward to your, your insight. Yeah. Uh, it's been an interesting landscape, I guess, in, in the last six months. It's not often in Australia we have two budgets within a, a seven to eight month period. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the federal budget was, uh, was a recent announcement. Yeah. Um, can you maybe start with what were some of the uh, announcements within that budget that affect investors and, uh, and what do we need to be across? Well, Michael, it was a bit of a ho-hum budget for the housing market. I think we've already had the policies you know, directed towards uh, the housing market, particularly through home builder. And of course, we had interest rate cuts during COVID as well. And that's always the, the go-to mechanism for the housing markets is lower interest rates. And uh, But uh, there were a number of, a couple of policies that were directed at first home buyers and downsizers. They're not going to have a significant impact on the housing market. Uh, I think the real uh, issue with uh, the budget was that it uh, consolidated all the fiscal stimulus that the government's been at to get us back to where we were prior to COVID. And I think that's the point that, you know, we're still seeing downward pressure on the unemployment rate. Economic growth is now above where it was. Uh, economic activity is now above where it was uh, prior to COVID. And uh, that, of course, reinforces confidence and, um, you know, material gain in our economy, which is, which is a good thing for the housing market and every other market. So I think that was the budget's focus so that will continue to support the economy. Um, we've seen the end of JobKeeper. There was supposed to be a cliff when that happened, of course. That was a notorious sort of go-to headline for most seeking clicks, and uh, that proved to be complete nonsense. In fact, I thought it was interesting that when JobKeeper finished, actually the unemployment rate fell. Uh, and I know there were a number of predictions that said that uh, once JobKeeper finished, we'd head back up towards perhaps a 10% unemployment rate. Well, that was just complete nonsense. And, you know, we are heading for an unemployment rate below five. And this is, um, you know, sooner rather than later. Um, and, and this, of course, is a, is a positive result from uh, the continued government uh, stimulus. And, and that was reinforced, as I said, consolidated in the budget. So it's more about the big picture, what the budget produced. And no surprise, it was well received. Uh, in all quarters, and it's just adding to the recovery momentum in the Australian economy. But some bits and pieces there for first home buyers, for single families, uh, and for downsizers, which will just, uh, I guess, take a little bit of the political heat out of, from the government because we are going to see fewer first home buyers in the market. Uh, and they're still, you know, very high levels, but that's just what we see with higher prices. Higher prices always mean, um, you know, fewer first home buyers as they get squeezed out of the market. It's still a big tick generally for the budget and it'll just reinforce the growth in the in the housing markets generally. Yeah, great. So uh, you, you talked about in, in the opener, I guess, that it's a, it's a really strong housing market. You need to be hiding under a rock not to know that, I guess. But uh, thinking about those fundamentals, obviously first home buyers have been very active in the last six to 12 months as stimulus has prompt them, prompted them back into the market and so on. Yeah. Uh, a very general question for you, so answer in as much detail and, and diversity as you like, but how's the current property market health check kind of looking and, and what are the key drivers that, that you're seeing you know, moving forward for investors to be aware of? Well, I think we're still in catch-up mode, particularly in Sydney, Melbourne and Perth. 
And that's the point that even though we've had double figure growth uh, uh, over 2021 so far, we're only around about uh, eight to 10% higher than where prices were in 2017. Um, so really prices in the big capitals or Melbourne and Sydney uh, have just moved around about the inflation rate over the last four years. And during that period, we've had over a 1% cut in the mortgage rate and we've had around a 6% increase in income. So that's why we're seeing markets catching up because they've got the capacity to pay more for property and all those barriers that were there have now been removed so they can get on with the business of transacting where they had put off those decisions over the last three or four years. Um, so, you know, we will get to a point where prices growth starts to push buyers out of the market because, you know, you just can't go to the bank and say, look, I need an extra 100 grand to purchase this property. Um, and uh, the bank will ask you, are you earning any more money? Well, no, you're not earning the sort of money that will let them lend you an extra couple of hundred grand. And you'll ask the bank, well, can you give me a, a cut in my interest rate? And you'll say, well, no, interest rates are, you know, as flat as they're going to go. So that means that we don't have the fuel to continue to push up prices uh, as they have been increasing this year. So the markets will just run out of steam. But um, prices growth will continue uh, going forward once we do get back to, I guess, that uh, natural level. Uh, and, and that's because people will be earning more, uh, the wealth effect, you know, be able to push prices up maybe 3 or 4%, I believe, on an annual basis. Because we know we're not going to see lower interest rates uh, because we can't go any lower. Uh, and we also won't be seeing higher interest rates for some time until at least we get those inflation up over 3%, you know, and we're sort of well behind that at the moment, and incomes growth is at record low levels as well. So um, it, it is a flattening of the housing market. But I think, Michael, one of the interesting points to the current environment is that all housing markets are part of this energy. Um, there's really no capital city that's missing out. Everybody's, uh, well, all markets are are really surging ahead uh, and we're looking at close to double figure growth on average this year and some markets are going to push over 15 percent likely and that uh, the big markets of, of Sydney um, Melbourne won't be too far behind that but look this is a consistency that we really haven't seen before and it just does reflect that releasing of that pent-up energy that uh, and of course the other thing we get it's like you know any part of a a market cycle that we, we're getting those annual spirits released. People are bringing forward some of their buying and selling decisions to be part of the action. You know, I think it's called FOMO, fear of missing out. And it's the reverse of when people tuck their heads in when things aren't that good, right? And they start to overreact in a negative sense. So um, uh, I, there's only a couple of markets that are missing out at the moment, Michael. And they're the, the CBD market in Melbourne, which of course was flushed with uh, development over the past three or four years. Um, that's suffered from the closure of international borders, particularly because of the, you know, the demand that, that those investment properties in CBD Melbourne have from the students, particularly also from tourists. And similarly in Sydney, the inner suburban uh, around the CBD in, in Sydney, those uh, unit markets are also suffering uh, because of a lack of a demand from tenants and that's pushed rents down and kept vacancy rates high. But we are actually seeing some adjustment in those markets now with vacancies starting to fall. But they'd be the only two markets, capital city markets that I would, or parts of the capital city markets that I would suggest are not producing very strong prices growth uh, at the moment. And I still think in any, in, in you know, in most instances, we're not seeing an easing so far. We're into June. Um, and although clearance rates, auction clearance rates have just started to come off the boil, they're still very much in favour of sellers. Even in the, uh, the Melbourne market, which has had the shutdown, unfortunately, uh, clearance rates have still been quite healthy um, and only pushed down by higher numbers of withdrawals, which is completely expected. But even the Melbourne shutdown hasn't had the impact this time around that it has uh, last year. Uh, and I think that's because the industry has adapted to, you know, when we do get the physical restraints to auctioning, um, that they, they, they can now quickly move to an online auction or, you know, a negotiation over the phone, these sort of things. And, um, you know, that, that market has held up through the, the uh, you know, end of May, early June lockdowns. And uh, I think it just shows you it's a very vibrant market at the moment. There's plenty of confidence from buyers and sellers. Um, and uh, it's still got some way to run, although we will see an easing as we traditionally do through the uh, winter selling season. And, and the market will trough out in, uh, in July, but 
Look, again, interestingly, we had a record day for the number of properties uh, that went under the hammer in Melbourne and Sydney uh, for a June day to start the month. So June has started with record seller numbers in the auction markets. So sellers are really pretty happy to keep, uh, keep testing the market. But, of course, we understand that those decisions were made uh, a month or more ago uh, in terms of the auction uh, listings. But when we look at uh, total new listings coming into the market, they're down around about uh, 10 to 12 per cent over the last two or three weeks, Michael. And that's just clearly the, the market working towards the break that uh, the middle of the year typically has. But this is a once in a generation housing market um, a boom across the board is very um, unique that all capital city markets are a part of it, only some very uh, sectional parts are missing out at the moment, but even they're starting to show some sign of adjustment. And I think the big picture is, is once we reach the peak of the market, we're not going to see the crack that usually occurs through higher interest rates. We're just going to see a, a, a gradual uh, easing in prices growth, but I still think it will continue to be positive. Yeah, excellent. So uh, you mentioned uh, uh, all of the capital cities um uh, markets are, are, are strong and, and, and you, you foresee that they will continue. Yeah. Maybe if we could just take a, a quick snapshot uh, for our viewers on the yeah. four main capital city markets, because that's where we focus in terms of our yes. investment strategy. Uh, could you just give us a, a couple of uh, dot points about each of Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth and where you see them right now in the next kind of six to 12 months? Well, the Melbourne market's been a relative underperformer compared to the rest, even though its prices will, will be above, its prices growth this year will be above 10%. Its clearance rates will, will have consistently been around 80%. It hasn't been the sort of white hot market of, of other capital cities. Um, and I think that's still because it's still got a little bit of catching up to do because it, had, it went in the double dip uh, lockdowns last year. And um, perhaps some parts of its market are more affected by migration uh, because Melbourne, of course, is the epicentre of international migration uh, than others. And, of course, the student market has also uh, been affected by the uh, international the closure of, uh, of our international borders. But uh, I think Melbourne has still got that upside um, because perhaps it's still catching up more than particularly Sydney because it is further behind its, or it's not, not as far advanced as that 2017 peak as Sydney has. So I still think there's that value aspect driving the Melbourne market. Of course, it's all very much dependent on the COVID environment. Um, and, you know, once that's behind us again, that in Melbourne, I think that it'll, it'll revisit that strong result. So but Melbourne, is, I think, is looking forward to a healthy spring selling season. Uh, and there's still a bit of catch-up energy in the Melbourne market. But once again, it, it is an across-the-board market. There's, there's no real, it's not a prestige market being strong or a, a budget market being strong. It, it's a market that's quite consistent in terms of the demand levels in each of the segments. And of course, the big picture what we should mention, Michael, for all our markets is we're seeing a big revival in investor numbers. Now, this isn't a surprise, and I'll, I'll just say that this is going to fuel all the capital city markets, and that is the, re, uh, the revival in investors. Investor numbers have been very low over the last three or four years, particularly as a result of a credit squeeze that, you know, investors haven't been really welcomed by banks. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a long story to that one. It starts with the APRA intervention in the market back in 2015, 16. And banks have really been gun shy in terms of lending to investors. Um, but obviously, investor in, uh, is almost irresistible in investor demand at the moment because viewing those very strong uh, capital gains, um, you know, investors want to be part of this action. And I think also banks are starting to, you know, realise that here's a, a significant source of income for them, uh, and that's the growing appetite of investors. And, of course, investors still pay a premium in terms of interest rates compared to owner-occupiers. So I think banks are starting to, to loosen the strings a little bit and bringing investors back into the market. And the data clearly shows a, a surge in investor uh, activity in terms of lending, uh, and that will continue to refill the market. And, and, Michael, you've got to understand that investor lending in Australia is sitting at around about uh, 21% of total market share. Now, that's still well below the 33% average, uh, long-term average for investor activity. So it shows you there's a lot of upside for investors in this marketplace. 
That will continue to fuel housing markets as investors want to get a bit of the action. Um, and that's another reason why I think that we'll continue to see um, upward pressure on prices, not at the same rates that we've seen over the first part of the year, but it'll keep markets ticking over as investors move back into the market. And I think that the, uh, the offset to that is fewer first home buyers. And they typically have that sort of symbiotic relationship. One pushes one out of the market. Higher prices push first home buyers out of the market and higher prices attract investors into the market. And that's what we're seeing now. Market share is falling for first home buyers. It's still well above average. And I think that that's going to fuel all those capital city markets. We are seeing strong investor, uh, increase in investor lending in New South Wales, Victoria, Western Australia and Queensland. Uh, and that will continue to fuel those markets. Now, if we look at those markets, perhaps a little individual, I think Melbourne's quite a, an even market in terms of its um, in terms of its demand profiles and also its price ranges and regions. Uh, as I said, the weakness there is the CBD market, uh, uh, and that's because of the, the you know the shutdown and international border closures. Uh, the Sydney market, again, similar to Melbourne, is really across the board uh, in terms of um, being a very consistent market for buyer types and price ranges. I think one of the interesting things for Sydney uh, in terms of migration is that we're certainly seeing upward pressure from a surge in expats coming into Sydney. And I think that's helping particularly those um, mid to high price ranges on the North Shore. Um, <clears throat> there's no doubt that they've been uh, fueled by, you know, the, the migration, even though it's fallen, um, Sydney's actually held its own in terms of, uh, of net international migration levels. Uh, and I think that's because it is a key destination for expats. And that is having clearly a, uh, an impact on the Sydney housing market in those mid to high price ranges. I guess we could call it those sort of family friendly uh, suburbs, leafy suburbs in Sydney. Um, but, you know, the, the Sydney market, again, with the exception of those inner suburban unit apartment markets, uh, is, is really, you know, leading the pack in terms of prices growth. It will be the top performer this year across the board. Um, but again, as with other markets, it's, uh, it's starting to likely to start to ease. But, you know, um, I don't want to predict 20% prices growth in Sydney this year because uh, we'd be starting getting back to the crazy days of 1988. Um, but it's really looking like it will exceed 15% the median price growth in Sydney this year. And units may even push over 10% this year in Sydney. And these are once in a generation results. And, you know, we've only ever seen it once before. Brisbane market, very interesting, Michael, at the moment. Uh, Brisbane, Greater Gold Coast, or Greater Brisbane, Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, uh, they're very strong markets. Again, uh, we'll record double-figure prices growth. The Gold Coast is particularly strong at the moment. And I think there's a key driver there, and it is interstate migration. There's no doubt that we've seen the migration numbers uh, falling everywhere sharply except Queensland. Queensland net migration, although it has eased, is now, Queensland now has the highest level of net migration of any of the states. Um, and uh, it also clearly, as it usually does, has the highest level of net interstate migration. But what we've seen uh, in the latest data, and it's a bit backward looking, is that the offset for a, a collapse in interstate migration, net migration from Victoria, has been picked up by Queensland. And I think that that's just adding to all the other evidence that there's a lot of southern migration heading into southeast Queensland. I mean, uh, not just the usual issues of climate and lifestyle, but also affordability um, is, is a key driver there. The Queensland market still, or the Brisbane market, median house prices are still half of those of Sydney and well below those of Melbourne. But there's certainly a big rush, particularly in the northern areas of the Gold Coast from southerners, a uh, strong market. And of course, if uh, southeast Queensland or Brisbane gets the Olympic Games, you know, that'll be just another driver uh, of activity there. But, um, you know, rents are rising strongly in, in Brisbane now, both houses and units. Vacancy rates are falling um, and yields are still very high there, you know, over 5%, which we, in, a, in a low interest rate environment, that is very high. So um, good returns for investors in South East Queensland particularly uh, and, and plenty of upside there because of the fact that they still are highly affordable compared to the southern capitals. You know, so people moving in there, and that's just not, but not just uh, house prices. It's also or, or home prices. It's also it's also rents as well. So um, if we look at Perth, and I, I guess that's the final one, uh, Perth's also a, a catch up market. I mean, Perth's median house prices—they probably now have reached it on current data. Uh, 
uh, have just got back to where they were seven years ago. So talk about affordable local market. I mean, if you're purchasing in Perth now, you're paying, you're paying prices that were, that are at uh, basically seven-year lows. Um, and the other point to that affordability driver in Perth is the building boom. There's been a remarkable building boom in Perth. It's driving its economy. Perth now has the lowest unemployment rate of any of the state capitals. Uh, it's a real booming economy there. Most of that driven by uh, the uh, the boom in residential construction. Uh, new new building approvals for houses in Perth are only now behind Melbourne. Uh, they're higher than any of the other capital city markets. So uh, plenty of upside there for Perth. Of course, it's taking advantage of the mining boom with high prices for iron ore. Um, so uh, and, and the fact that it's got plenty of upside for price potential prices growth. Uh, because prices have been flat for so long. And the rental market in Perth, it's amazing that they've basically run out of rental properties in Perth, uh, given we could just look back a few years and, you know, every second property was vacant. And uh, now we have uh, virtually, you know, a, a, a shortage or, or, or a lack, complete lack of properties for rent in Perth. And that, of course, means that, that rents are skyrocketing in Perth at the moment. So, um, you know, all those four markets are in uh, seriously positive territory, Michael. Uh, prices growth will continue uh, to the end of the year. Uh, it'll move from what I believe, you know, super strong to solid uh, as those affordabilities rise, uh, as affordability barriers rise. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's a remarkable market environment now. And uh, I think it's remarkable too for the fact that we can still see with quite some certainty that there's plenty left in this market in terms of prices growth in all those capital cities and in most areas. Yeah, no doubt. It's uh, it's amazing. <clears throat> Just some uh, anecdotal evidence of what we're seeing on the ground to the points that you talk about. Uh, you know, in uh, in Brisbane, uh, completely infill area, yeah, family belt as I call it. Uh, there was the uh, the final stage release in a in a boutique uh, development that uh, that happened uh, three weeks ago now. 56 lots. Uh, I spoke to the agent at quarter to nine. There was a queue of 30 people out the door and 50 of the 56 sold in a day. Uh, my rent went up 120 bucks a week in Perth six weeks ago. So, you know, the vacancy rate at, at 0.5, 0.6%. So it's, uh, it's amazing. You know, when I, when I look back, if we, if we take the Perth market, for example, if I look back, you know, three, three, four years ago, uh, it, it seemed a long way back yeah. to you know ten years ago from now when the vacancy rates were under one percent and we saw dramatic rental increases. But I think that's the thing, uh, the takeaway point uh, for everyone watching is that market cycle and yes. and the unique uh, opportunity that we've got right now is that all of the markets are strong, as you were saying, and that's not not typically uh, what we see. So. You partially answered this, but just, I guess, to wrap up and given there was so much for people to take in there, we often get the question, oh, the markets are moving, have we missed the boat? Now, you and I know that if you take a long-term view, uh, prices in 10 years are going to be a lot more expensive than what they are today. Yeah. So by when you can and mitigate your risk, a lot of that risk is mitigated by, uh, you know, the, the uh, lending going to be uh, predictions to be more favourable to, uh, to investors, as you said. The fact that there's still some steam into the uh, into the markets to be seen, uh, and specifically given the vacancy rates uh, are so tight and the rents are up, it means you know the 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 smart investor is going to be able to hold an investment property for nothing out of their pocket. So you know from a from an opportunity to to enter the market and to be able to see some some capital growth moving forward, you, you don't feel it's too late. You still feel that there's some some room to move, and it's a good time to be investing. Well, absolutely, and and the point is that you know there's there's really no sign of a of a slowdown, Michael. Uh, even though we're moving into the midwinter market, um, results are still quite strong. I mean, it, it, we will ease uh, through the middle of the year because people just have other things to do, and a lot of buying and selling's been satisfied. You know, we've had big numbers, so people don't just buy another house next week. But the the point of that is that you know we've seen that. Um, Investor numbers have been very low, even though they're rising now. As market share, they're at very low levels. Um, they've just come off historically record low levels. Um, so we know there's going to be growth there. What we have to do is look at the lending trend to see how sharply upwards that is from investors. 
there's no artificial barriers to investors now going forward because the banks are, are more inclined to lend to investors finally. Um, so they're quite happy because they, they have smaller margins with low interest rates. They want to make sure they're making some profits and investors pay more for their interest rate anyway. So it's a no-brainer. Hey, banks, you know, wake up, you know, lend to investors. And the fact that prices growth still has plenty of upside to it, the economy is recovering, the risk factors are certainly, you know, mitigating as we speak um, that are traditionally looked at in terms of, you know, the housing market issues. And then the other side of the equation is that, as you said, rents are rising, vacancy rates are low. You know, there's the, the risks for the investor and the big risk for the always for the investor is not being able to get income source from their rentals, you know, because once you've got that locked in and there's plenty of demand, you just create your investment model based around your income, right? Uh, and, of course, income, uh, capital growth is just the, the gravy on top of it, you know. Um, and we see that in just about every market now uh, where rents are rising and vacancies are falling and vacancies are quite low. Um, so it's it's almost a sort of a perfect world in that sense going forward. And that means that we can be a lot more uh, precise about predicting this market. Now, the cycle is going to be a lot flatter. You mentioned cycles. In a lot of ways, we're just sort of getting back to a, a normal market that has fewer cycles or at least flatter cycles because all those interruptions are behind us. But the biggest interruption or the creator of a cycle are interest rates. That's what creates the ups and downs, you know, higher interest rates, lower prices, lower, and it's a cycle and it's like, but it's like the pebble in the pond, you chuck it in and it ripples outwards, right? But it's now worked its way through the system and the inflation genie and the interest rate genie, it's back in the bottle, right? And we're going to have to get a serious economic boom here to get, to get inflation out of the bottle and uh, interest rates following it, you know, and that's a great thing for our housing market because it means you're not exposed to the variances of uh, monetary policy, higher interest rates, right? Um, and even though there's still a lot of the nonsense chat about it's going to happen tomorrow and the slightest sign of inf inflation is like, oh, here come interest rates, you know? Like I said, just take the Reserve Bank word for it because they're saying they don't believe uh, interest rates will rise till 2024. Now, an important thing in terms of interest rates, you know it's 10 years since we had our last interest rate increase? 10 years. And I think we're further away from an interest rate increase now than we've ever been, you know, uh, because it, it's going to take something very special to push inflation where it is, at, you know, tracking around record lows to get it up to 3%. And income growth is just 1.5%. We're going to need 4% income growth. So we've got a lot of work to do to get there. Michael, and we certainly, um, you know, uh, can't use lower interest rates because they're at zero. And the last thing we would be wanting is higher interest rates because it would knock this recovery on the head. So what I'm saying is it's got this incredible level of certainty, a flatter cycle, because we don't have to worry about interest rates going forward. And there'll be plenty of chat from the usual doom and doomsayers trying to talk up the prospect of interest rates. It's just not going to happen until we get the wages growth and the inflation that we had a decade ago. And we are so far away from that. But what a great environment taking away the, the biggest unknown in property investment, which is what am I going to be paying for my mortgage, you know? Um, you're basically almost locking in a variable rate at the moment, you know, because it will be the same, I believe, you know, for the foreseeable future. And uh, it means you just work on those local factors when you're making your investment decisions, you know, and that becomes a lot more predictable and, and a lot easier. Absolutely. It really, uh, really good way to put it. And uh, I guess it's, it's, it must be nice, I guess, for, for the general market to have, you, you use the word certainty. It's very easy to forget. We've had a lot of volatility, yes. you know, in, in, in the last 10 to 12 years, not only was there G, the GFC and the overhang from that, uh, we, we'd started to rebound strongly. Then it was the APRI imposed lending restrictions, 15, 16, 17, that you talked about. Yeah. Uh, we just got through that. Things were picking up. The fundamentals are strong. COVID hit. The fundamentals are still strong and, and so on. So it's uh, the, the, the message that I would say to our, uh, to our viewers is, I guess it's easy when you've been doing this for a long time like, like we have, but if we can see sustained price growth over the last... 10 plus years, given how these cycles have been more volatile than normal, uh, it, it, that certainty you talk about is, 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 is going to be a really, really good time to be in the market. 
yeah. knowing that, uh, as you say, the uh, the growth is the gravy on top. Yeah, that's right. And and, that, and the other point is that um, returns on investment are still holding up compared to underlying returns. I mean, it was announced last week, um, one of the banks announced that they've got their, their latest deposit product for those that want to put their money in the bank, right? And they're trying to attract people with this, uh, you know, new product. And it had an interest rate, an annual interest rate of 0.05. <laughs> That's 0.05. Uh, and the current rate, if you've got 10 grand and you've locked it away for a year, uh, you're going to get about 0.3 of a percent, 0.2 of a percent. So, you know, yields are still holding, um, even for, you know, gross yields for units uh, in some of the, you know, in Brisbane are holding at around 5.5%. Uh, if you add 10% capital growth to that, and maybe less for units, you know, 8%, um, you're getting a 14% return, gross return, uh, on your investment. You compare that to what you're doing when you put your money in the bank, and then you've got to get taxed on that, you know, 0.3 of a percent. Um, and, you know, with property, you still get all those tax incentives of, net, you know, of capital gains, discounts, uh, tax depreciation and negative gearing. So um, I think we're seeing more investors realising that this is also an incomes play uh, in a low income, low uh, yield environment. And that's just adds to the, you know, the capacity now for a much more consistent outlook for capital growth. Now, what I'm saying is we're out of the roller coaster. So it's not, you know, up, it's not up 15, down 10. It's just going to be up four, up three, up four, up three, up five, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so the cycles are much flatter but it's a much more consistent growth and we're not, you know, worried about hitting the big trough or else, you know, sitting back, you know, uh, having the, the once in a, a few year boom and then knowing we're going to have to pay a price for that down the track with higher interest rates. You know, it's, this is a completely different outlook for the market now. We've still got some energy left to keep pushing prices up, I reckon, for this year. Uh, and then it'll start to ease. Uh, I think the first half of this year will be the peak of the, uh, price growth rates, um, but it'll still be solid to strong for the rest of the year, you know. And of course, you know, then we've got, if we open our borders, then we've got another, um, you know, a lot of demand to come into the marketplace, you know, and uh, I'm sure migrants will be very happy to be looking or trying to get into Australia as, a, you know, and I think that's one of the things that is driving the Brisbane market. Interestingly, Michael, it's not just of the usual factors, it's also that perception of being a COVID safe haven, um, which is quite interesting because particularly the Victorian and Melburnians that have suffered another shutdown are perhaps even more motivated now to head north. I mean, Queensland's always been a preferred destination for Victorians or Melburnians, and um, uh, maybe that's, you know, and that is clearly one of the, the factors that's pushing the Queensland or Southeast Queensland market up at the moment. But just imagine if we get, you know, hundreds of thousands at least of those wanting to come into Australia, um, they got to find somewhere to live. And as I said at the beginning, we, we are, but even with the home builder package driving, you know, significant levels of new home building, we're still, I believe, fundamentally undersupplied uh, in our in our capital city housing market. So when you know when migration picks up again uh, and borders are open, we're going to really hit the skids in terms of uh, you know running out of property for people to live in. Yeah, excellent. So uh, I guess you, you've talked uh, during the course of this interview around the consistency of all the markets being strong and, and yeah. so forth. Uh, I feel I've got to ask you the question because this was the title of our uh, of our presentation, yeah. but um, are there any particular hotspots over and above, you know, kind of what you've mentioned around those key yeah. drivers in the four main capital cities? Uh, As I always say to investors, do your homework. Um, and that means looking at what it is that makes an investment property an investment property. And I think you need to look at, firstly, uh, areas which have the lowest vacancy rates uh, and therefore the highest um, rental growth, uh, and there are suburbs or regions within areas. Uh, and then look at, obviously, the uh, growth rates in terms of capital growth, uh, uh, the entry-level costs, and then that puts together in the yield play. So look what the yields are. And then, of course, for individual, that's for gross yields. So that should help you identify markets which have um, a better return for you and also better uh, potential performances. And that can reflect 
the local economic performance, because obviously uh, demand for rental properties it, it can be higher in areas uh, where there is better economic performance. That's a lower unemployment rate, particularly. Uh, and also areas where there's not a lot of new building happening uh, in terms of the new supply. So you take a scientific approach to that, Michael. Uh, there's plenty of free data around that you can get hold of to create your own model. Now, some people you know, prefer to invest in units or houses. They want a higher potential capital growth or a higher, or a higher potential yield. Uh, and they can adjust what their particular personal preferences and priorities are according to the sort of models that you can set up with that data. But it's quite easy to do that. And as I said, you just take a scientific approach to it. Uh, and with a much more rational market now in terms of, as I said, the end of the cycle, perhaps, or the end of the, the roller coaster cycle, um, it means that, they, that that tends to be, you know, a really good, give, give you a good outcome. Because it is about looking at those local factors um, and deriving a model from that. And you can start at the capital city base you know, as a base and look at the gross yields, uh, capital growth, unemployment rate, vacancy rates, rental growth for each of the capital cities, and then work through each of the regions if you pick that capital city. And, and look, it can also be you know how much you've got to spend, like uh, markets with a lower entry point uh, can maybe uh, be a preference even for those that uh, against those that have higher returns, but they have a higher entry point in terms of, of what you've got to spend. Um, but, you know, in my journey, Michael, and this, I meet so many people, uh, and I, you know, I've, I've got so many presentations now, um, and, and I chat, you know, and, and it's amazing that, and I don't want to use the word ordinary, but people who are just, you know, you, you'd expect them just to be sort of middle income, um, you know, that horrible world, middle class, I don't know what does that mean, People and then I speak to them, and they've got four, five, or six investment properties. You know, and you sit back and you do the math, and you think, "My God, they're worth you know four million bucks, and it, it's all being paid for, and it's running beautifully." And they're actually looking for the next one, you know. And they do this sort of quietly, and it's just such an amazing way in Australia to build wealth. You know what I mean? But I think if you take that rational, scientific um, approach to what you do buy uh, and be guided by people, you know, who do, can do this for you um, and have perhaps advantages in terms to, of market access, I just think it, it's a no-brainer, particularly at the moment where I think, and, and look, don't even sort of listen to myself, I guess, or whatever. Just look at what's, what other investors are doing. And we are seeing a surge in investors across the board in Australia at the moment. So they're all getting on the bandwagon. Um, that's, that's clear that investors, and we know that, that, that that's not a surprise. And, um, you know, the, the whole point is that there's, there's really no downside risks compared to other periods because of the fact that we won't get higher rates, interest rates, and because we've got shortage of rental properties everywhere and we're not going to see a flood of international, um, you know, migrants uh, coming into these uh, low vacancy rates, you know, so it's it's almost a perfect storm, isn't it, Michael? Yeah, we were uh, we're definitely uh, very positive and, and up and about, uh, and you've done a, a, a fantastic job there at, at helping um, our viewers understand again those fundamentals that drive markets. It's very easy to be swayed positively or positively or negatively from a a big headline, you know, that's designed to sell the papers. But when you look at at the fundamentals, um, you know, there are six that we focus on, supply, demand, jobs, affordability, yep. government infrastructure, spend and stimulus and lending policies, all of which we've covered at various points today, yep. uh, then it gives you a really good recipe. And I had a question for you about, you know, should investors be, be doing anything different or considering adjusting their strategies? But uh, you already covered that. I guess the, the key takeaway point is understand what you want your investments to deliver for you. Understand a proven process and follow the process and don't deviate from that process. Uh, you follow a proven process, you get a measured outcome and, uh, and all the conditions are lining up pretty well to, to where we want them to be to, uh, you know, to see some positive growth and, and very positive cash flow with investment property moving forward. I, I also think just reflecting on the people I do meet that have portfolios, I think the hardest investment uh, decision to make is your very first one. You know what I mean? 
Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. I think once you've made your first one, you're off and running, and it, you know, it, and it's a good one. Obviously, you need guidance. Um, you're off and running, and then what? And it just builds its own momentum, you know, because you use the capital growth, you use, you know, and 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 then it, it sort of has that um, almost, you know, sort of exponential growth uh, potential, because one, it just becomes one takes a while to consolidate, and then two, it gets you quicker into three and then three gets you quicker into five, you know, those sort of things. Because, and you can, you know, you work the process um, and as I said, with interest rates remaining, you know, flat for the foreseeable future, it, it's really an amazing environment, an, un, an environment we've really never had before, uh, you know, of access. I mean, we've had periods in the 60s and the 50s where we had a different environment for borrowing, where there wasn't a lot of investor activity, um, but, when you borrowed then, you had to put in almost half the capital value of the, or the property value just to get into the market. Uh, and, of course, now, you know, you can, you can borrow so much easier and there's so much more competition amongst banks to get a good product. Um, and I think that's, that's another fact that banks are, are really starting to think, hey, you know, I've got to start lending to investors again, you know, because uh, we're going to make some money out of this. And, and the market is certainly, you know, less or, or less risky, not that it ever was risky, than our perceptions were in previous periods. And, uh, you know, uh, that only works again for the investor, you know, going forward. So uh, it's, uh, I almost feel it's too good to be true, Michael. And, <laughs> you know, but it, as I said, it's all supported by, you know, the, the facts, I guess you'd say. It's, there's nothing here that's embellished or exaggerated or... Uh, you, you can clearly see it and, uh, you know, the only ones I feel sorry for a little bit at the moment, or not a little bit, but are first home buyers because they are going to struggle going forward now. But we've had a uh, second highest proportion of first home buyers in the market over the last 12 months than we've ever had. We have to go back to 2009 to see more first home buyers in the market. So, you know, we've done our job getting people into the market. Uh, those first-home buyers have taken advantage of flat prices and some stimulus packages over the last couple of years. Um, and, um, you know, it's just those wanting to get into the market are just going to have to work harder and save harder to, to sort of realise that dream. But, you know, at the end of the day, we've all had to do that. You know, if some people get in on the, I guess, the, the, uh, the front part of the train. Some people have got to wait down the back and take a little bit longer and work a bit harder. But uh, we all know the rewards involved in that are so positive that uh, the aspiration for home ownership and home investment will always underpin what's, you know, probably the world's strongest housing market. That's a, uh, that's a really good message to end on. Andrew, uh, absolutely take action, buy when you can, you know, be in it for the long term and it'll pay you dividends. So uh, fantastic to talk to you once again. Thanks for joining us and uh, look forward to doing it face-to-face -face next time. Good one, mate. All good. Thank you very much. So some fantastic insights there from Dr. Andrew Wilson, as always. What we've got here, uh, some key summary points. There was obviously a lot of information that Andrew shared with us. Uh, six fundamental things to keep front of mind at all times based on what he was saying. The first one is that we are still undersupplied in the housing sector. We talked about the supply and demand drives growth in the housing market. It really drives growth in anything. Making sure that we're understanding we're still undersupplied means there will continue to be upwards uh, pressure on prices, especially when we see this influx of overseas migration that he talked about when borders reopen. Australia is going to be an appealing place for people to live. Uh, the government have a vested interest in welcoming those people with open arms as the fastest way to regrow the economy and start to generate the revenue that they need to uh, offset the uh, the COVID stimulus that they've provided and uh, and bring us you know better economic growth as a result. Number three, decreasing unemployment means that we're seeing a positive effects of all of the uh, government stimulus that was provided. The government threw the kitchen sink at at uh, putting our economy on idle, as we've spoken about uh, in previous webinars. That's worked well. Uh, the uh, the economy is in a better position than what we uh, could have possibly expected, and the outlook is uh, is very positive. Also, Andrew was very particular around making sure that you assess 
the suitability for investments around not only applying a process, and I'll share with you next what our process is and how we go about it, uh, but around uh, making sure that you've got the capital growth uh, projections and, and forecasts well understood, understand the drivers of those, and making sure that you're mitigating your risk by having a solid uh, cash flow position, ensuring that you can hold the, uh, the investments without it really impacting your lifestyle and mitigating against interest rate increases when they happen down the track. The real positive there, obviously, that we didn't get into is if interest rates do increase, that doesn't just happen because the sun came up this morning. It happens for a reason, and that reason is that there's been economic growth to warrant interest rate rises. So it's always important to remember that prior to interest rates going up, we will have seen house price growth. We will have seen wage growth, employment growth, rental growth as well. So for investors, all of the growth in rental and tax benefits through higher wages uh, really make sure that we're offsetting a lot of that increased holding costs as interest rates go up. It was really interesting to see that uh, uh, Melbourne and Perth were really leading the resurgence with regards to increases uh, in building approvals, not just increases, but having the highest two uh, building approval volumes in order. Melbourne, number one, Perth, number two. Uh, that is a great thing for demand, uh, very good for the economy. Uh, obviously, construction is a major employment vertical <clears throat> within Australia. And finally, a big takeaway for me was that Andrew was uh, saying that the banks will have an increased appetite to lend to investors. It's been very hard for investors uh, to be able to borrow uh, compared to historical standards in the last four years since the uh, that the worst of the APRA-induced restrictions occurred early in 2017. So some good uh, good news on the uh, on the horizon there as far as borrowing is concerned to uh, sustain the um, the price trajectories that we're uh, that we're in right now. So let's have a look at uh, while we've got uh, viewers today that are no doubt familiar with uh, Open Corp, who we are and what we do for the first time as amongst us. I thought I'd just very quickly share with you. Uh, exactly what we do, so you understand, I guess, how we fit into this whole process. Uh, fundamentally, our specific point of difference is the investment property selection. We are not uh, builders, we are not developers, we are not real estate agents, okay? Uh, we're not selling our own product. Our specific point of difference here is that we apply a map process, that is our property selection criteria, which I'll share with you next. And we have an internal research and analytics team whose job is to be doing the assessment nationally on areas that fit those criteria and uh, provide the best possible investment opportunities for our clients uh, at any point in time. So Andrew talked about applying a process and doing research and assessing against fundamentals. Uh, that's exactly what we do. So if all of what he was saying made sense to you, but you're thinking you just don't have the time nor the inclination uh, to be able to dig through and find all that research and you want it done for you, that's the first critical part of what we provide. No one wants to be fixing toilets at 2 a.m. in the morning. Don't self-manage the properties uh, for two reasons. Number one, it means that you've got to buy it close to your house, which is uh, a, uh, a strategy that doesn't work well uh, as far as investment is concerned. Uh, and secondly, you don't want the hassle. We have property management in-house. We manage all of the ongoing tenant relationship for you. Those fees are tax deductible. Uh, when we say properties pay for themselves, that includes property management costs, rates, insurance, and so on. Uh, save yourself the headache. You live your life. We'll manage the properties ongoing. Before we get to actually managing the properties, though, it's really important to make sure that your finance and loan structuring is set up to be able to allow that compound growth to occur. The way that most banks want to set up your finance is to ensure that they've got it all bundled together as effectively as possible for them. That's a real handbrake for us as investors, and we need to make sure that we've got as much control and flexibility around the finance structure as possible. My team will take you through that in the individual strategy sessions. It's not complex. It's not rocket science. Uh, it's just a little bit more effort, but it's well worth the increased effort to effectively keep, keep your own home safe and make sure that you are calling the shots on when you add to your portfolio as opposed to the bank. Finally, 
get to be part of the Mentor for Life program. So I'm hoping that you are starting to get the flavor now if you're new to uh, what OpenCorp do, that we take a very education and data-based approach to what we do. Uh, it's kind of like a housing analogy. There's no point building a house without a foundation. Okay, uh, You've got to understand the right way to build wealth through property investment uh, hence why not only do we share information like this with you as opposed to relying on the mass media to get your, uh, get your information, which is very emotive-driven, you come into the source, we've done it ourselves, we help our clients execute what we've done, and we hold your hand basically start to finish the whole way through the process. We're so confident in terms of what we do that we provide guarantees and protections to de-risk the investment we're effectively putting our money where our mouth is. Uh, and while there's a whole team of people, uh, Open Corp is your, your property investment powerhouse with over, over 50 staff. You don't want to be dealing with that many people. We have single points of contact from a relationship management point of view. But fundamentally, as Andrew and I talked about during the interview, taking advantage of the power of compound growth should be your number one priority. Don't get me wrong, one property is going to be much better than none. Okay, One property will get you a better outcome than the pension in retirement. But those that really understand the power of how, to, how you can springboard from one property into two, into three, into five, and so on, as Andrew said, uh, they're the ones that create real wealth. And as cliched as long-term relationships sound, that's exactly what we're providing, where we are guiding you through that process with consistent reviews to assess your portfolio and your individual situation so that not only can you uh, add to your portfolio when you can, but so that you're keeping your finger on the pulse or over the long term to make sure that you're optimising your portfolio at any point in time. That might be refinancing to save on interest rate. It might be driving the rent up to be able to ensure that the property is bringing in more cash flow. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. We feed you the information, but we're here basically to hold your hand start to finish, and guide you through the whole process. So that's what OpenCorp do. Uh, let me share with you now specifically uh, how we get the kind of results that we get. So Andrew talked about the research process and having a research process. What's really important to understand is our research process hasn't changed in over 20 years. It was taught to us by our mentors, and hence it's been exactly the same property selection process that Al, Cam, Matt and I have used to add to our own portfolios, that our staff used to add to their portfolios and that our clients used to add to their portfolios. Uh, please take that literally. It's not just the same strategy. I've got some clients that have investment properties in the same street as my own okay, and the other guys likewise. So if you do have the time and the, uh, the knowledge and the inclination to drill through and find all that research and do the assessments and analytics yourself, let me share with you at a very high level uh, in the short amount of time we do have what our property investment selection process is called. It's called MAP. We give a lot of detail about it in Cam's best-selling book, My Four-Year-Old, The Property Investor, but I'll give you a, a succinct summary on the three steps and what we look at right now. MAP stands for Market Area Property. So it is a process of elimination where we're looking at which capital city market or markets make sense at any point in time. What determines that is not only supply and demand, which is fairly obvious, that needs to be the, the primary focus of everything that we're putting together around property selection, uh, but it's about understanding where the different markets fit within the cycle. You know, we've heard Andrew give uh, a, a detailed assessment on where he sees the different markets and the driving forces, which markets have seen substantial growth, which markets have some more room to move, and the underlying factors and macro macroeconomic factors that, uh, that feed into that. Basically, what we want to be doing is buying where we still have growth potential to be seen as opposed to buying towards the top of, top of the market where the majority of the growth has already occurred. That's a really common in, uh, mistake that most investors make is they tend to wait for a market to see three or four years worth of growth before they step into and have the confidence to make that decision and, and, and take that leap and buy property. 
The problem being, if they're buying towards the top end of the market, then they're just waiting an extended period of time before they start to see that market go through another growth cycle. In that seven-year period or thereabouts, they've lost confidence. They think property doesn't work. It's far better to be in a market and be 12 months too early than it is to be 12 months too late. Once we've got the capital city market side of things worked out, we want to drill down into the specific areas, suburbs, uh, principal activity centres, growth corridors, etc. that, surprise, surprise, fulfil all of those same uh, market criteria. So essentially the six fundamentals that I talked about during the interview with Andrew. Uh, if you didn't write them down before, you've got a five-second warning, grab a pen and I'll share that with you those six fundamentals once more. Supply, demand, jobs, affordability, government infrastructure spend and stimulus, and lending policies. Probably not surprising that those are the six things that, uh, that Andrew talked about as he was going through. Clearly unprompted for me, but this is what the experts look, like, look at when they're analysing data to determine where the house price growth is going to occur. Andrew talked about limiting supply. Uh, that's what we mean by infill areas. It's by buying uh, in existing suburbs surrounded by established housing where we are just limiting the available supply on the market. In Cam's book, My Four-Year-Old, The Property Investor, and pretty much every other property book that's ever been written, people talk about the amenities, school shops, public transport, recreation, and so on. They're all important, but supply and demand has to come first. Abundant owner occupiers is one of our key criteria, and part of the reason uh, why we can protect our clients against vacancy risk. We're only going to areas that are majority owner occupied. The reason for that is just supply and demand in a different form. If we are restricting the number of investment properties, then it just means that we've got quality areas where the majority of people have decided to live themselves, close to the amenities that you need, close to work, etc. And that just always means that we've got a rental demand should your tenant move out. But more importantly, we've got more leverage to be able to drive the rental growth up over time, given that there's a relatively small number of rentals and that above average demand. So that's the market and the area part of our process. If we then get down to the property side of things, this is really where Open Corp can help you move the needle. We charge a fee for our service for doing all of that. It's not built into uh, a property price or hidden. It's fully disclosed in terms of what it is and what you get for that. Uh, my team can share that with you uh, during the individual strategy sessions. But the reason why I say that we will be able to save our fee for you through the relationships and the leverage that we provide basically comes down to optimum size and quality. And what that means is making sure that we are getting an optimal property, not bigger than what we need, but efficient and optimised to ensure that we are bringing in as much rental income as possible, getting as many tax benefits as possible without overspending on the house, given that's the part that drops in value. What it also means is we get an optimum product in terms of the floor plan uh, of the property, uh, the yard space within the property, and how we uh, put that together, as I said, as cost effectively as possible, while meeting all the design guide, the guidelines and quality control criteria for an area. So if you're getting something optimal, you know, think of it this way. You might be paying... 20,000 or 30,000 less than a bigger property where the square meterage is unnecessarily larger. Even if you're getting the same rent, if not more rent, if you're getting more rent and you've got a lower holding cost, then that basically means that the property can pay for itself day one. And when you run the numbers, it actually means that you can hold two properties based on the open court formula for exactly the same cash flow as one property at the same purchase price. So when you start to understand the power of compound growth and what that extra property would give you, just imagine those, are, those existing investors amongst you, if you bought another property 10 or 15 years ago, 
and it was no more impact to your cash flow, the amount of money that that would have created for you in wealth, you can start to see why our clients use us and why our fee for service, including all the protections that we provide, is the main reason uh, that our clients use us and not only use us, but uh, come back. Because we're very proud of two things at OpenCorp. Uh, one is the fact that since we started, half of our business each year has been repeat and referral. Uh, we've been doing it for 15 years. You can't fake it for that long. If our, uh, if our clients are seeing results and they're getting great service, we want them coming back to get their next property. We want them telling people about who we are and what we do so that we can help those people in their network as well. The second thing that we are most proud of is our track record. And we actually had to make a submission to uh, ASIC going back a couple of years where we looked at the track record of all of the properties that we'd sourced for clients uh, in the 10 years prior. So this is a sustained track record on what we've achieved. Uh, the total return achieved by OpenCorp in that time frame was 10.8% per annum. That's a mixture of capital growth and net rental yield. But when we compare that against the ABS residential data for the performance of the Australian capital cities over the same time frame, uh, they achieved a 6.8% return compared to our 10.8%. Return. So when you uh, look at that in percentage terms, we've beaten the market by more than a third in that time frame. So the best way for me to summarize for you is this. If you want to take all of the information that we put together, take the feedback from Andrew Wilson and go do it yourself. Uh, please, you're most welcome. Take that information, but for goodness sake, please follow the map process. And we talked about doing due diligence and following the formula. Here is a formula that you can use. This is the kind of track record that we achieve. Okay. Alternatively, if you don't have the time, the knowledge or the inclination, you want to make your money work for you, you want to be in the market, given the really solid foundation, the once in a lifetime boom that Andrew was talking about and you want to take advantage of that, then you've got a decision to make right here. The decision is, you can either take positive steps forward this year, get started or at least add to your investment portfolio and look back you know, in 10 years going, this is fantastic. You know, uh, I've, got, uh, I've got an amazing outcome here. I'm really glad I took action back in 2021. The alternative is to overanalyze, wonder whether the markets move too much, whether you're making the right decision really not apply all the information that we've shared today and miss the boat, okay? Like I said in the, uh, in the interview with Andrew, I ask a lot of people the question, if you could have bought a property where you lived 35 years ago, would you have done it? I'm yet to meet someone that says no, okay? Just remember, over those 35 years, there have been a range of upturns and downturns. So what if I said to you 35 years ago, hey, you could buy a property today, it would be worth this much in 30, 35 years' time, but over that journey, you're going to have downturns, like when negative gearing was removed, when it came back. The recession in the early 90s, the Asian financial crisis in the late 90s. Uh, the September 11 tragedy, the GFC, four years of really tough lending restrictions, the list goes on, okay? What we've tried to do today is to really give you data and facts around the fundamentals that drive markets and get expert opinions in addition to what we know at OpenCorp to be able to help you make informed decisions and understand exactly where the market is at. I understand that the headlines will change from Monday to Wednesday to Friday. That's the nature. They've got to sell papers. So I can encourage you, because I've been doing this for over 17 years myself, that when you take a long-term view and you mitigate your risks, the kind of results that you can achieve through property investment are phenomenal. So if this has resonated with you today, we'd love to be able to help you at a next step, not look at property yet, but look at your individual situation to understand what's possible, where you're at right now, and make some recommendations on what might be possible and how we can help. Again, there's no charge nor obligation uh, for that meeting. Uh, our team will be in touch. Uh, we've been buying by, 
bombarded with over 135 requests for these strategy sessions for each of the last four webinars. Uh, it's done on a first come first serve basis. So if you would like to talk to my team, please click on the button in the, uh, in the email that you'll get after this session, along with a recording to, uh, to today's webinar. And we'd like to sit down and help point you in the right direction, see what might be possible for you. So that brings to, uh, to the end uh, the formal uh, part of the, uh, of the webinar today. And we're going to kick into some question and answer right now to answer some of those burning questions that have been sent through uh, ahead of today. Thanks for joining us and we'll uh, look forward to seeing you next month. So we've had some fantastic questions being sent through ahead of time. Thank you to everyone for contributing to that. And, asking all the questions. Uh, we had hundreds. There's, uh, there's no way we can get through absolutely everything. But while we've got Dr. Andrew Wilson here, thought that's a great opportunity to be able to get some of his insights as well to the questions that you have. Uh, Abby, take it away. Thanks, Boz. Um, we've got a question here from Liana who would like to know, what is the ideal property mix with regards to location? Well, that's one that I can maybe start with. Uh, we are big advocates, Liana, of having a diversified portfolio spread across different, uh, different locations, different capital cities. The reason for that is, uh, is twofold. Basically, not only does it allow you to get access to multiple growth cycles within a, a set time frame, uh, but it gives you a more consistent growth trajectory on your portfolio. If you have all of your eggs in the one basket, then when that market moves, you do very, very well. Uh, when it's in its stagnation phase, you're sitting on the sidelines for an extended period before it comes back and grows again. But if you've got exposure to different markets, then you're seeing more consistent growth, uh, I guess, across that uh, across the portfolio in general. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk around if you if you buy interstate or somewhere different, you can avoid land tax. That is a, a, a benefit, I guess, but you'd want to be basing your investment decisions based on where you can get the, the best amount of capital return and, and, and rental yield, as Andrew talked about, uh, into your portfolio as opposed to saving a few hundred bucks a year on land tax. Great. Thanks very much. Um, so we've got a question here from uh, Vita who would like to know, how do you capture growth when the demand is more than supply? How do we capture growth? Yes. Uh, so, uh, Andrew, let me know if you've got any insights. I guess what, I, what I'd say is, is uh, when demand exceeds supply, that, that's the fundamental for seeing a growing market. So unless I've misunderstood the question, I'd be saying get in a, a, as early as you can, right, um, and, and, and buy when it's possible to take advantage of that growth upswing while demand is exceeding supply uh, as opposed to coming in at the height of the boom uh, because typically after that is when uh, a lot of supply tends to come onto the market through developer activity. Uh, which can then, you know, really reduce the uh, the capital growth and really what starts that stagnation kind of phase of the market cycle. Anything to add, Andrew, on on that? Well, look, obviously you take advantage of it by buying something, and um, because prices are rising, that's the clear fundamental of economics: is you know, uh, higher demand and uh, you know, lower supply means higher prices, and uh, that's what we're seeing now. Um, but yeah, you, you take advantage of it by being in the market. Um, but, you know, again, it's, as we discussed, whatever, whether it's locations or uh, the, the mix of, of property types, just do your homework, you know, and um, look for, I guess, sustainable uh, growth. And, um, you know, that's all about recognising, because you do buy on an individual property basis, um, you know, the factors in a local market uh, that will, you know, act to keep demand ahead of supply, you know, and obviously keep... Uh, property prices with upward pressure and, um, you know, keeping investors, you know, obviously content with their propositions. That sounds great. Um, a question here from Michael who would like to know, will the, will the ability to gain finance and increase your borrowing capacity improve in the short term? Sounds like it from what we covered during the interview, Andrew, when you said banks' appetite for lending to investors. Yeah. Uh, anything to add on that? Well, I, I think that um, uh, 
you know, the the investor or the bank appetite for investors is growing, and just as the investor appetite for borrowing is growing. And uh, I think a lot of the restrictive lending practices, which were over restrictive, uh, are starting to be, you know, re-examined. Uh, and that's why one of the factors why we're seeing more investors in the marketplace. Uh, we're not going to see any, what I suggest was lax lending. Uh, lending standards will remain uh, quite rigid. And look, at the end of the day, that's one of the secrets to the Australian housing market is that we have a, you know, a banking system that has very strong market power. There's only four of them. Yes, they make massive profits. So they don't have to worry about, you know, being over competitive in a rising market, trying to get, you know, a bigger share of the, uh, the pie by easing their lending, uh, their lending criteria. They keep lending criteria quite rigid. So it means we don't overborrow, you know, within the context of, um, you know, the general market cycles. Uh, so, you know, banks are very risk averse with their lending. And over and above that, you know, we have the Reserve Bank who's clearly stated, you know, uh, because there are some, you know, voices of concern about strong prices growth, that it may lead to, you know, sloppy lending, that the Reserve Bank has clearly said that it's uh, keeping a very close watch on lending standards. So they're not going to change. They will be quite rigid. It's just that the demand from investors is rising and any of those sort of um, overly negative conditions that investors had to face are now being eased and it's more of a, a sort of a normalised market. It's still, you know, not easy to get an investment loan. Banks are still a little bit sort of fish-eyed about it. Um, and, you know, as I said, investors have to pay a higher interest rate than owner-occupiers. Uh, which is basically a risk premium, which, you know, I can't sort of figure out the justification for that. Well, I know what it is. It's making more money. That's the justification. But, um, uh, yeah, look, I think that we're, that's a good thing, thing that uh, lending standards will remain quite rigid and, that, uh, and that's a very good thing for the market. And, again, once again, a, a secret for why our housing markets continue to be so robust and resilient. I think it really talks to, uh, I, I talk about underlying confidence, you know, as an investor. And while the headlines will talk about how much the market's gone up and with the insinuation that things are overpriced, it's very important, as you say, to remember that anyone borrowing money today can easily repay it, even if interest rates were higher than what they are today because of those lending standards. Yeah. So we, yeah, that's why we don't see the crashes, you know, that the, the US has seen, that the fundamental lending practices are chalk and cheese. Uh, so uh, absolutely gives us a lot of confidence uh, around uh, while we're spending a lot of money on property that we're, uh, we're confident in the bank's processes. Great. Um, I've got a question here from Belinda who would like to know where you guys would recommend um, she gets updated information with regards to investing. The Open Corp monthly webinars and the seven books that we have at Open Corp and the 300 videos online, Belinda, that we call our WODs. Um, I'm joking. They're all resources that you can uh, that you can absolutely tap into. Uh, Andrew, I mean, you're, you're the research guy. Um, we, we, we look at, you know, RP Data, ABS, yes. uh, you know, Urbis, uh, Bistrap, New Oxford Economics, all of the, the major re uh, research houses for, for, our, um, for our information. Uh, what, what could you recommend as well? Well, keep, keep tuned in because my housing market will soon have a raft of uh, data products. Uh, I have a lot of back-end data products uh, which match or even, you know, uh, 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 broader and deeper than a lot of what offered. But, look, there's plenty of free product around. Um, the essential data that you're looking for is really provided through uh, enterprises such as CoreLogic and PriceFinder. Now, you have to pay for that stuff. Uh, those others mentioned, BIS and Urbis, they're, they're all secondary providers and usually use ABS data. They certainly don't have their own access to their own data. But um, the ABS obviously has data uh, in terms of lending data that comes out every month, uh, building approvals data, economics data, which is always a useful starting point um, in, uh, for looking at aggregated market conditions. The portals such as uh, realestate.com and Domain offer plenty of free data there that you can use to research uh, properties on a more individual suburb or regional basis. 
Um, and, uh, you know, you just do your homework in terms of looking for that data set. As I said, you don't have to be paying anything for this, uh, but you can get from the portals, uh, the real estate portals, uh, plenty of free data, uh, and the ABS provides you with uh, a, a lot of also uh, data that uh, supports and supplementary to housing market activity. And um, not sure it's worth paying for the data. Uh, at that level, it's more in the sphere of a real estate agent or, you know, professional uh, market uh, players, enterprises, rather than, um, you know, sort of uh, individual investors. But um, as I said, watch out. My housing market will have plenty of free stuff uh, or certainly low price stuff uh, specifically designed for investors, uh, and that'll be coming out pretty soon. Just a bit of an ad there. <laughs> Very good. Um, so we've got one more question here from um, Nilo, who would like to know your recommendations on the kind of property to consider purchasing as an investment. I might take that one, and because uh, I said uh, during our conversation that the types of properties that you need to be investing in, we're not investing in these investment properties because we love them there are means to an end to deliver a financial outcome that we want to achieve. So first things first, uh, you know, you need to understand where you want to end up, uh, understanding that end destination and what your portfolio, what you want your portfolio to deliver for you financially is, is the key point. Uh, assuming that you're taking a long-term view, uh, my personal um, strategy and, and, and hence what we help our clients with, given what we do at Open Corp is help our clients do exactly you know, what we've done ourselves uh, is to, to really understand the power of compound growth. Now, positive cash flow is nice, but when you start to look at not only the growth that one property creates, but multiple properties create, and as Andrew said, one goes to two, two goes to three more quickly, three goes to five more quickly, that is compound growth. So if you start to think about some of these people that he talks to that have substantial portfolios, and to use a round number, say got you got 10% return on a portfolio of four to six properties, those numbers from a capital growth perspective start to get really, really appealing over and above, you know, three to five thousand dollars a year of positive cash flow. Uh, you need to be smart about what you buy and make sure that your investments are ticking along in the background, not impacting your lifestyle in the process. Uh, but that's why we put the emphasis on capital and compound growth. Uh, to create real wealth. So understand your own end outcome, uh, invest in properties that will deliver that end outcome. Uh, rule number one for us is understanding the power of compound growth. Great. And um, just to end on, on uh, one last one, Lee has just requested to know where would both of you buy yourselves right now? <laughs> Uh, well, I would uh, I would be buying. Um, uh, I'll answer the question this way. Uh, I've got my portfolio spread across three or four major capital cities uh, in Australia. Uh, the only capital city that I don't have property in uh, is Sydney. Uh, it hasn't made sense to uh, to buy there. You know, in uh, uh, in in the time when I've been able to buy, it's been out of cycle. Uh, you know, especially given it's the uh, the most expensive uh, housing market in Australia. So uh, I would add to my portfolio in any of the other three capital cities right now, depending on, and the specific location would depend on your existing portfolio, uh, the diversification that I mentioned in my answer previously, and, uh, and making sure that the, uh, the cash flow, depending on your individual situation, was, uh, was obviously well within, uh, well within reason and, uh, and most likely paying for itself. So I have to answer that, do I? <laughs> well, I've said before I would take a, and I'm asked this all the time and I never answer it because it's not my role to be suggesting where to invest, but I do say this. Um, I've always, as I said before, you take a scientific view to this, uh, look at the areas that have the best results in terms of the key uh, fundamentals for property investment. And if we start at a capital city level, in the first point, if we looked at yield, uh, the two capital cities with the highest yield for units are Brisbane and Canberra, um, but the, cap the cities with the highest uh, uh, growth potential into, or that are growing fastest at the moment uh, in terms of capital growth uh, for houses uh, are Sydney and Perth. 
So uh, then you have to sort of work through each of those particular, I guess, driving forces to find something that actually could be better on a suburban basis. So just because Canberra has the highest uh, yields for units, gross yields for units of any of the capitals, doesn't mean that there's another uh, a suburb or a region somewhere that actually has a better return for those units than the Canberra units. Because at the end of the day, you're not buying Canberra as a whole, you'll be buying a, a suburb and a street and a particular property. So again, I would do, if I was a professional property investor, I would do my homework and identify the areas that tick the boxes in terms of what I would be looking for. Uh, and then look at um, you know the, the sort of economic fundamentals and also the market fundamentals for those. So stay tuned that I might have a little app that does all that for you. Uh, and you can you get that one and you can search at your heart's content for the best capital growth prospects and the best the low, you know all those sort of bits and pieces uh, on a suburb basis Australia wide. So uh, I'll be using that one myself, Michael, to identify where I would be buying at the moment. Very good. The, the last thing I'd say to Lee, uh, Lee, as we've mentioned a couple of times, uh, the whole purpose of the individual strategy sessions that we offer uh, our viewers today at no cost and no obligation is to sit down and look at your individual circumstances. Uh, we'd be able to give you much better guidance on that once we understand uh, what you're looking to achieve, where you're at right now, your existing portfolio and so forth. So uh, click the button in the, uh, in the email, request an individual strategy session and my team will be in touch.